stop just for a sec. Count the pieces of technology that are with you. AirPods. Smartphone. Car. Watch. Book. Yeah, books are technology. Want to notice more? I'm Adam. And I'm Chris. Find us on the Device and Virtue podcast. We argue the wrongs and rights of technology and faith in everyday life. Your everyday life. Okay, unpause. Back to your regularly scheduled podcast. Hey, everyone. Before we get started, let me remind you that Truce is listener-supported. I'm working hard to do this show full-time, which would mean bigger, better episodes for you and a healthier work-life balance for me. You can help out at trucepodcast.com slash donate or on Venmo at at trucepodcast. The links are in your show notes. Nobody else is covering these huge topics in a sensible, researched, and high-quality way. So help me make more truce. Trucepodcast.com slash donate. Okay, here's the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Truce Podcast. My name is Chris Stern. I'm the host of the show. We're now at the end of season five. And in the upcoming weeks, there's going to be a few takeaway episodes that come out that kind of revisit some of the themes from this season. It's spring break, and it's been a very busy couple of months for me. I've gotten in a car accident. Actually, my car was hit from behind and then at a different time hit from the front, and neither of which was my fault, but I had to take care of that. And then I also had to move and there's just been a lot of things going on. So I'm not going to release a new episode this week. We'll revisit this old one. And then in two weeks, God willing, you'll get some new content. Thank you for your patience with me as I take a little bit of a rest for myself and continue my research on season six. Okay, here we go. I stopped by my local church on a cold, rainy day. Hello. Hey, hey. How's it going? Oh, pretty good. Well, the place is rearranged. Oh, little by little all the time. I live in Wyoming, in a small town which, by now, you know a lot about thanks to the last few episodes. I met up with two members of the staff, the pastors Ray McDaniel and Carl Klemmer. You brought a musical instrument with you? Yes, I'm going to play the mandolin. Oh, wow! (laughs) It'll just be some gentle background music. Yeah. First Baptist Church is on the corner of Cash and Kelly in Jackson, Wyoming. What had once been home for the sheep eater tribe of Native Americans became a hideout for horse rustlers, quickly blossomed into a tourist town, and now is the wealthiest county in the nation. Nestled just a few blocks south of the town square is this small wooden church. The congregation was organized on March 16, 1911, well over a hundred years ago long before our sanctuary was constructed in 1979. We'll start out maybe by walking around and just talking about the physical building at this church and some of our memories in this place. So can we head out to the fellowship hall? Sure, sure. Okay. Together, we're going to take a quick tour of this church and then we'll get to some serious stuff. We started the tour in the fellowship hall. It's got tight Berber carpet, stackable chairs, folding tables, and an industrial kitchen. I just love when this room is full. And it's stirring with life. And we have a whole line out the door in the summer and lots of seasonal workers and coming through the line and grabbing food and just enjoying each other's company. It's just the, this this room is full of life. I think of lots of other stuff too. I think of vacation Bible school. Uh, They eat the little goldfish crackers and the snacks and then they cover them with finger paint and that sort of stuff. I think about all that stuff getting ground into the carpet. That too. And the number of conversations I've been with people that like, this carpet is so messed up. (laughs) We can't get the spots out of it. The carpet should be messy. Mm -hmm. That's what I say, because that means the church is being used. It's active, yeah. Yeah. From the fellowship room, we move to the hallway, which is pretty narrow. Two people can pass each other, but just barely. Like they have to turn their bodies as they go. Well, this place really, it forces you to be in close quarters with one another, which I've always loved. Yeah. There's been proposals in the past for bigger space, but we've always found that when people are close together, we're happier. Yeah. We're actually a lot happier. And then it was on to the entryway. Coming in off the street, you walk in the main door, up a few stairs, and there is this foyer with vaulted ceilings. And they have couches tucked into the corners. I think of, of Golden Gary right up here. He's one of our elders, and he he just kind of sits right over right right here by the entryway. And he is he's good at reading people. And he'll meet them and begin asking questions. Are you from here? Are you around the valley? And um, from that, right here in this room, uh, people have come to know the Lord because, because He's so warm and welcoming. 
No church is perfect. I've been attending First Baptist for something like 11 years. I've laughed there, I've cried there, I've recorded this podcast there. People have spoken into my life and others have said hurtful things. I've said hurtful things. Again, no church is perfect because they're all filled with imperfect people. I met with Carl and Ray in May of 2021, after a year that included a pandemic, Black Lives Matter protests, the contentious US presidential election of 2020, so many things. A year in which we humans took a look at each other and said, oh, so that's who you really are? And we learned to be angry. Liberals at conservatives, conservatives at liberals. We grew bitter towards each other and towards the church. In this episode, I want to take you inside one small local church that I happen to attend. Because this has been a time in which we all demanded so much of the big C church, meaning all of Christianity. I wanted to see how those stresses and those demands impacted one imperfect congregation in a distant corner of Wyoming. We'll start out with the fun stuff, you know, take you on a little tour, let you get to know the place. Then we'll pull back the curtain to see how one year can shake a congregation to its core. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause in the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. This episode is brought to you in part by He Gets Us, a national campaign bringing the story of Jesus to every zip code. Reaching over 1 million people daily with more than 275 million views on YouTube, this is the largest campaign ever to open hearts and minds for Jesus. Now, He Gets Us is giving churches free ways to connect to the campaign so they can leverage the moment and movement for their ministries. When you connect, you'll get resources designed to give your people new ways to have conversations about Jesus and understand the culture they encounter every day. Things like discussion guides, reading plans, sermons, and more. It's easy. Just go to hegetsuspartners.com to learn more. Then you're ready to click those buttons that say, get free tools. He Gets Us is helping people discover, rediscover, and talk about Jesus. And you can too. Just visit hegetsuspartners.com to learn more and join the movement. Why well, we can walk into the sanctuary here. It's a, it's a wooden sanctuary, so it is constantly cracking. We were here in a small group last night and, and everybody kept looking around. It's like, yeah, it cracks a lot. It's like being in the hull of a ship. Yeah, it <laughs> it's actually kind of like an upside down ship. It has ribs very much like that and the construction is uh, actually the walls <laughs> have cables that are holding them together and you're supposed to tighten those cables occasionally <laughs> nobody knows where any of those tightening points are or the wrenches so they just, it'll, it'll be fine yeah. i think it'll be fine yeah yeah the sanctuary at this church is not just the place where you hear the sermon or preach the sermon um this sanctuary has has been the place for two or three different local choral groups get together. It's a very warm sounding room. And so they love to practice here. We have a great grand piano that was you know, donated in memory of someone back in the early 80s, late 70s. There's a Awana. giant circle in the middle of this room during Awana where uh, kids are running around and running circles and getting head injuries. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, another fun memory for me here is that uh, this room is the first place that my second film, Bringing Out Bobby, premiered. Oh, wow. The first time we ever showed it to an audience. And the, the, one of the main characters has a mohawk. And Scott Aiken, who used to be the music leader here, had his kids in mohawks. Oh, cool. Which to me was like this, the greatest... That's awesome. Compliment, like that he would go to that length That's to put cool. the kids in Mohawks. It is truly difficult to name all the things that go on in that building. It really is. Awana services two days a week, Bible studies, a ministry that helps immigrants with their citizenship, child care, Al-Anon, Alcoholics Anonymous, scout meetings, and counseling. 
we average one to two people per day seeking some form of financial need. We shared a lot of memories of this little First Baptist Church. I'll include some more of my favorites as a bonus episode at patreon.com slash trucepodcast. This small church has a lot of responsibilities. And in the last few years, it has been pushed in some pretty stressful ways. We went back to where we started, Ray's office on the ground floor, to pull back the curtain on a small church in a contentious year. So on top of all the things that go on normally here, in the last few years, it feels like there have been a lot of added pressures on the small C local churches. Can you talk about what that has looked like on the ground for you guys? Oh, boy. I mean, they're, they're, they've been pretty obvious, you yeah. know, mask, no mask, left, right. Why aren't you talking about these things from the pulpit? Mm-hmm. Um, and really our answer is because we, we want to keep our eyes on, on Jesus. I mean, we, and, we, and we truly do. And it's not a cop-out. It's not a cop-out. These are the things that matter. These are the things that are eternal. In every age, this is going to matter. And if you understand this in humility, then it will it'll affect the way you live out your faith. If you choose a side, you're going to end up being, I believe, damnably wrong. I, I think that either side of most of our major hot-button issues leaves out something. Uh, it tends to be the human way to deal with uh, difficulty is I can't handle nuance, and so I'm just going to make a choice, flip a coin. If... If it's red team versus blue team, I'm going with the red team or I'm going with the blue team. And once you make the choice, you don't have to think about it. They've already got a ready-made prescription. For me, I'm usually dealing with direct people who have come to trust. This is hard, sorry. (laughs) They have come to trust me not really knowing me because they are either in the the congregation or they're listening online. And what I keep saying is what it says next. I'm just going in order, expository preaching. This is what it says, as uncomfortable as this may be. This is what it says. How do we arrange our lives to go around this? And after people get a steady diet of that for a while, they say, I think I can trust this guy. And then they come in and they say, I'm in a desperate situation relationally. I cannot forgive my mother. Or I'm in a desperate situation maritally. I have cheated on my wife. Or I'm in a desperate situation financially and I can't afford to stay. But I love the people, the church, my job. I love this. And I can't, we can't do it anymore. It's just not possible. So there's a relational, personal level. And if somebody says, well, I know where he stands on that. I can't go to him because I'm thinking... I can't see any other way out except for abortion. And I know how that guy feels about that. If if I made the whole sermon about that, and I've been the chairman of Turning Point here as a pregnancy resource center. We do everything that we can to try to help pregnant ladies to, um, to choose life. We do everything we can to help them along the way. Some of them still don't. Um, This is one place in Wyoming where abortions are offered and our hospital has begun to offer them. And, but if I rail against it from the pulpit, I never have that conversation with somebody who's actually living the problem. And um, so to be compassionate and to be uh, accepting and know that whatever my struggle is might not be their struggle, but I still struggle. I still have a problem. Um, If I can link up what, issue they're going through with whatever problem I can't solve for myself, and I can direct them to the same higher power who has helped me with my problem that I can't solve myself, I want to be able to engage that. And the more politics enters into the pulpit, the less chance I have for doing that. Well, thanks for saying that. I I think one of the things that really sparked this for me was a conviction of my own actions, um, because I, first of all, hate social media and have threatened to get off it multiple times. And then my listeners say, no, you have to stay on it. It's like, but I, but I want to get off it. Where I've messed up is to say the church, capital C church, yeah. needs to do this, needs to pay more attention to this thing. Not thinking, first of all, there is no such thing, organization, physical organization as the capital C church. Right. Who am I talking to? 
one of the things that's really struck me the last few years, reading Jeremiah right after the, the attacks in January 6th, I started reading Jeremiah again. Um, I, I find a lot of comfort in Jeremiah. That's great. He's a, yeah. he's a faithful witness for 40 straight years, and nobody listened to him. Yeah. So as a podcaster starting out... <laughs> He's your, he's your Sorry, guy. I'm he's your guy. Years into this. Oh, you're still starting yeah. out. If you look at it at 40 years of yeah. fruit, 40 years of faithful ministry that produced almost no fruit in his time. Yeah. But where do you receive comfort now from yeah. Jeremiah? For Jeremiah. And one of the things that I found really striking about reading Jeremiah was um, there's there's a lot of condemnation of, of Israel, um, but oftentimes it's a we con- a condemnation, not a they. And so my tendency is to be like, those people need to fix this issue. When it's like, no, I'm part of those people. As Jeremiah seemed, his burden was for his people, That's right. not for those people. Right. And I yeah. think that, that that to me has been really striking. Or how many times you guys in your preaching will mention, it says you in this text, but what it means is y'all. Yeah, that's right. Um, and that, that has been really striking to me how often that comes up in because the New Testament. we're so individualistic in this country, we don't read collectives well if it says you it's a promise for me you know and we read god's promises and say you oh i know the plans i have for you 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 know (laughs) yeah ray mcdaniel yeah that's 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 a promise i'm gonna hold on to that promise and so if the preacher does say something that you don't like you go find another preacher And if on social media you disagree with the people, you unfriend them or unfollow them and you don't have to pay any attention to them anymore. Or you're frustrated by If you're frustrated by them enough to have a conversation with them and to say, hey, we're diametrically opposed on this. I would love to call a truce just to figure out where you're coming from. That'd be great. Or, hey, can we study this together in the Bible since we're both in the body of Christ here? Can we study this together and see how we could kind of take our own opinion out of it. I think that'd be great. We, we sought to, during uh, COVID, we sought to have gospel conversations. And so we'd record two or three days a week, you know, and we went through a Bible story from one of the gospels each day, and then we'd talk about it. And that helped me, and I think it helped Carl and it helped Blake to get through that time and when people were chomping at the bit to get back together, why are we still not meeting? Uh, and we got a lot of angry letters, uh, a few angry letters, few angry conversations. Some folks come into elders meetings and, and, and there wasn't even unanimity among the elder board. It was just a difficult time. Um, those gospel conversations were what were helping ground us. And so again, I say scripture is what's going to last forever. Uh, there's something about just taking in a dose of God's word on a regular basis and discussing it with your friends to see how your life lines up with it, you know? I feel like so much pressure has been on you guys and on the other staff members of the church to bear the burden of not just COVID, but Black Lives Matter and, the you know, Donald Trump versus, you know, the other candidates and stuff. So that must have been really difficult. I guess you see you guys, your eyes are a little bit moist as you're looking at me. Uh, the thing that's been convicting in me is to, to remember while I write, uh, you know, the church needs to be paying more attention to this on Twitter. What I should be saying is I, I am part of this group. We should right. be paying more because it's too easy to be like, you go fix this thing. Right. And the other thing I've noticed is that, um, and maybe this is a little sensitive for the listeners, but uh, if I could speak to my, from my heart. Um, I feel like this has become a time where a lot of people are coming to small C churches so hurt that they're kind of looking for a reason to leave. They're waiting for that magic word of somebody to say the wrong thing about one thing, and then that's it. And they can say, well, now I can leave. And that, that's that been really hard, um, even as a podcaster. Well, I, I don't have real direct access to my, my listeners or feedback, generally. Oh, I hear from them. Do you really? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me what they say. <laughs> but uh, you know, I do hear when people are upset about things. Yeah, I do. It's a fair. I can't believe that this is going on. You know, and they rail against it, or um, I can't believe. Have you heard about this? I'm like. I actually don't pay much attention to the news. I do pay attention to the news, but I I filter it 
through other means. And if I watch 15 minutes of one side, I watch 15 minutes of the other. I try to average the two out, figure out something happened. Uh, this side's really upset about it. This side's really happy about it. That doesn't surprise me. But if I spend 15 minutes there and 15 minutes there, I'm trying to make it a habit to, to, to spend time in the Word about whatever that subject is. So how do we treat the other? How do we treat the stranger? How do we treat those who are different from us? If God says that our mission is to every tribe, tongue, and nation, it's all the ethnicities, ethne, pontata ethne is all of the ethnicities, then yes, black lives matter. And to just answer back immediately with all lives matter and then have people say, well, you're a racist for saying that. And it spirals out of control as long as everybody's ready to be offended. What we are to do is to bear one another's burdens. If I, I'm not black, I'm, I'm a white guy, I'm a, I'm a big white guy. And I am not ever going to have that experience, but I can put myself in the position and have empathy and compassion and love and mercy and, and think about those things critically instead of just saying, well, we too, you know, or, and, and being on the edge of my seat about getting mine. The, the Bible is about laying down your rights for the benefit of, um, of others. At least that's Christ's example is to lay down his right. He could have called 10,000 angels. He left the glories of heaven. He emptied himself. He made himself nothing so that others would benefit. And so if we're seeking to live after him, that's the way that we'll live our lives. And it won't be offensive to us about our group. Every tribe, tongue, and nation, ecclesia, the churches, called out ones, the, the ones who are called out. So we're called out of whatever our little group is, and we're called into the capital C church. To, to be able to live a father, forgive them for they know what not what they do sort of existence, ah, they're wrong. God help them. I mean, if that's, that's it rather than, I must convince them. <laughs> I have to convince them this Sunday, and this is the way I'm going to do it. The most convicting thing for me recently has been Mother's Day sermon on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. It says the works of the flesh are obvious. Everybody sees those all the time. But the fruit of the Spirit is this, allowing the Spirit to change your life from this hopeless garbage over to love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and oh, gentleness, ah, self-control, ah, self-control. I will yeah. say those things don't get podcast listeners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just trying to stir it up is what you're saying, huh? I'm just no. saying. Like, yeah, I, I know. But that's the truth about social media too. Um, General Jesus, meek and mild, is not a is not nearly as popular as the guy with the whip flipping over the tables, mm -hmm. you know. And I think we all want to be the, justifying ourselves, like, well, Jesus flipped over tables. Yeah, he had a reason, you know, because those people were keeping people away from God. They were they were blocking the approach to the merciful God, whose love and kindness endures forever. Yeah, there's a reason to flip over a table there. But whether or not the taxes are going to go up or down or who's going to who's going to say or do what on the news this evening, that's not something to be upset over. I've heard a lot of people say, especially again on social media, um, if your church is not saying, especially like Black Lives Matter, if, if you're not having this big to-do about race, mm -hmm. then you need to leave that church. I've, I've heard a bunch of people say that. My fear is that our churches are not as extreme here as the, I've, I've seen in other cities and other places. Um, but my fear would be, if I were a leader, if I make a big stance, those people who are already struggling with extremes are going to go seek those voices mm -hmm. that will meet those needs. That's right. Does that seem that seems accurate? That's a pretty reasonable way to, to see things. I know people who are chomping at the bit that they just want for um, they want for that to come up. So I hate to retreat back to this again. If you have a steady diet for, I've been here nine years and two summers as an intern before that. And each time that I've gotten up to preach, I didn't preach on anything political. I did have some things where we talked about church and state and where they meet and what we can do. Uh, what we can do is personal and a bunch of people collectively gathering and acting out 
of what this says in humility does have a voice. So for me to keep on doing that over and over, they don't expect for me to be political. We have lost people to other churches who preach politics from the pulpit. Some denominations are inherently more political than others, and that's on the left and on the right. I, I don't understand that. I don't understand that because God's infinite and I'm finite. And I know that my finite leanings lead me in a certain direction, but what the infinite loving God is trying to do is pull me away from my opinion into the center of his will where he can love people through me. And I feel like I alienate half the audience if I choose a side. So it's not a cop-out. I am a centrist, no doubt about it, a centrist. I think that both sides are wrong and damnably so. I don't think that there is any doubt about it. And for me to say that to my own family back home, the church I grew up in, or to say it here, I have people just get exasperated and literally throw their hands up and walk away. Because, well, the other people are worse than we are. And I'm like, both of you are wrong. Two wrongs don't make a right. That's just the way that it is. So getting back together, uh, seeing people's faces recently after vaccines have been offered and uh, after we have kind of, as an elder board, made a decision that we're open up and inviting again. Um, and folks who wear a mask and folks who don't wear a mask are both welcome in this space. Um, we will try to do our best to protect you. Um, we have been doing the, the next right thing for as long as we could. And even then, it's been fraught with peril. Crazy was alive and well. Yeah. There, was, there were people that had some very extreme views, and, and it was hard. And we realized just how, how uh, right under the surface yeah. that it was for so many. And that was a, a bit surprising, too, mm -hmm. just how close it was to the surface, what, what COVID has really revealed about about the, the hearts of our people and our own hearts. Yes. What were, because I'm sure that a lot of listeners are going to be having family members and friends who are, you know, they have their politics right under their sur the surface and they're hurt. What worked best when people would come to you with hurt? How can the listeners, is it just listening? Listening helps. Yeah. Listening helps. Yeah, for sure. A, a soft answer. Mm -hmm. A soft answer turns away wrath. And it, and it really does. So I had somebody come in three years ago who was uh, struggling with addiction. And, and the 12 steps are great, you know. So I actually printed out the 12 steps for that person. And when I printed them out, I printed out two copies. And I thought, I'm going to start, I'm going to go through these. I never considered it before, I don't think. I mean, I knew, I knew what they were kind of in a vague way. But I thought, am I doing this step one? Do I have a problem that I can't do anything about myself? So I identified what my issue, one of my issues, but, but one of them that I thought this is one that I need to watch out for. And it's a problem I can't solve. And the more I try to do, the worse it gets. And then the second one, and I, and I started going down that list. It's been the most helpful thing because the Bible has, it's replete with examples, you know, but that along with these 12 steps to reconsider how it is that I'm viewing this, it's been really helpful. And it's given me a greater peace to be able to deal with people who are accusing me of being bad or wrong or whatever. And it's helped me with the Father forgive them for they know not what they do. It's helped a lot with that. So I, I recommend that to everybody. <laughs> One of the things I've appreciated, of course, no local church is perfect. No, no group of people is going to be perfect. You get two people together, they're both wrong. I mean... <laughs> But one of the things I've really appreciated about First Baptist is that we seem to be the church where people go when they have nowhere else to go. We have a lot of ex-Catholics. We have some ex-Mormons, Methodists, Baptists, all over the place. Um, and I really like that. The thing is uh, that I like about that is that we have to sharpen each other. We're, I'm constantly bumping up against people yes. in small groups and things. And I've led a number of small groups in this church, folks who come from a different tradition and believe differently. And um, the, the temptation then is to be like, argue with this person, mm -hmm. love the person, or leave the church because they're all hypocrites. You know, if we come to the Bible or church or conversation small group with people that hurt and being like, if they say this thing, yeah. um, that thing is probably going to get said. 
and then you're going. It, you should just expect it's gonna you're gonna hurt. But I feel like so much of the Christian life is being open to being wounded in a yeah. way, yeah. Uh, to being convicted, so that we can change, mm-hmm. so we can, yeah, become more like God. Hopefully, um, is there? I know that a number of my listeners are are dealing with uh, working through deconstructing their faith to try to pull apart the stuff that they don't see as being biblical or being part of Christianity and, and, and keep what's what the core thing is. But my, my fear in doing this, this show uh, is speaking to that audience mm-hmm. is I don't want to make people so angry at the capital C church that they don't go to a small C church. I, I think that, there are a couple different ways to do it. What you've chosen to do is to look back. And so when you look back and you say, we missed it on this one, folks, we missed it on this one. We tied Christianity to something that's not Bible, that's not God. Anytime you tie Christianity to anything else, it changes it, it, it morphs. And when it's used as to manipulate or try to move people in a a mass in a certain direction, that's a problem, whether it's happening in the dark ages or whether it's happening in the current day. uh, It's a problem when you tie Christianity to anything else. It's a pet peeve of yours. And so when you look back, you see and you tie all these things. And I've I've heard almost all. I missed the last episode, but I've heard all the rest of them. And when you see that, you go, we missed it right here. And or, or the church missed it right here. There's always a remnant. There's always, 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 even in Jeremiah's day, even in Amos's day, even in um, our day, there's always a remnant of people who are humbly seeking what God has for them. And they're trying to love everybody. And I think that when people come in angry, if you truly love them, I think that most people respond well. I, I know that we have lost folks. They've gone to other places, they've gone to other churches. As far as I know, no one's walked away from the faith. Um, but it happens sometimes. People get so frustrated, they throw their hands up and they just walk away from it entirely. I know we've lost people. The problem that I'm seeing is not, oh, we lost those people and I love them so much. I still love them enough that I want for them to be okay. And so if that if it takes a route for a while where it's wrong, where it is political, where it is uh, off of the mark of Scripture, my goal then is to pray for them that God would restore them lovingly and mercifully. Not that he restores them back to this church. I don't care whether they come back to the church or not for my own benefit. I'm saying I want for them to find a place where they see themselves as God sees them. Right. Uh- if you were to talk to somebody who's deconstructing their faith and struggling with going to a physical church because there are so many expectations on a church, what, what would maybe you say to that person who's struggling to go to a church because they can't find one that fits all the exact things that they need, they think they need? I, honestly, to come unarmed. Yeah. You know, come unarmed. Uh, that in humility. Um, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. If we would come to the local church unarmed, knowing they're imperfect, that person's imperfect, that person's imperfect, I'm imperfect. But with uh, with an attitude of humility, uh, like in Colossians 3, that bear with one another. If I forgive one another as God has forgiven me, um, I, I think it, it, it really it softens us. Yeah. But it, it seems that so many are walking in the doors uh, armed, armed to the teeth, <laughs> ready, ready, for, ready for battle. But if we could approach one another with, I'm unarmed. I didn't come to fight. Mm-hmm. I know you're imperfect. I know I'm imperfect. But we've come to gather around a perfect God here, yeah. almighty. Uh, and so the encouragement that I would give to those who are wounded and those who have church hurt um, is really, it, it truly is, fix your eyes on Jesus. I don't think that I could say it enough. Mm-hmm. It, it really is a fix your eyes on Jesus. He's, he's the, the pioneer and the perfecter of our, our faith. Let's gather around him. Amen. In this time, it, it, it's, it's good as we are coming back together in person in churches and people are being vaccinated and things. This is a good time 
to encourage people, I think, to be the one to take the first step and to start healing relationships. Um, I had a friend of mine, um, we got into a kind of a heated conversation in the sanctuary months and months and months ago about masks Mm -hmm. and why I wasn't coming to physical church. Mm -hmm. It got got a little heated, and uh, but then he took the adult step. So we ran into each other in front of the hardware store. He took the adult step and fixed the relationship, healed the relationship, asked for forgiveness where there needed to be forgiveness, cool. and healed it. And it's like, that is what we need to be doing. Amen. If I didn't have a relationship with him or with a church where I could be convicted, and that, that healing would never have happened. Mm-hmm. You know, If I just walked away and said, I'm never going to that church again, that healing would never have happened. And I think we're better friends now than we ever were. And that is that is exactly as it should be. Um, the fact that the Lord's Prayer itself, and Jesus throughout, but the Lord's Prayer itself says, you know, to forgive me as I forgive others. Oh, my goodness. Is that what I really want? It is what I really want. I want to be just as forgiving as you are, God. That's good. That's really, really, really good stuff. So if... I am looking for an opportunity to mend a relationship. My life's going to be better. You can't mend them all. You can't. Uh, But if you're leaning towards it, it's like God leaning towards us with grace, leaning towards us with mercy. Um, If we're we're leaning towards people, um, we're going to have more, I think, success than failure. Well, it's just like you said, if if Jesus can be on the cross actively being crucified and say, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do, I can forgive somebody for saying something nasty at church. And so I had a professor one time in seminary that said um, 90% it was a, it was a counseling class. Uh, And he said, 90% of the couples that come in, when you ask what you can help them with, 90% of them will say that it's communication. Uh, We just don't communicate or we're not communicating effectively. We it's communication. We're never on the same page. And he said, would you read this first? And it was something from Luke. And he says, read this one from Jeremiah. And so he's all right, how, how about that one from Luke? And it says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, now read that one from Jeremiah, your favorite. It says, our hearts are desperately wicked and who can understand them? Hey, if our hearts are desperately wicked and who can understand them and out of that overflow, our mouth speaks, then sometimes we say things we don't even mean. And once you've said it out loud, you have a choice to go, I shouldn't have said that, and I'm so sorry. It was what was in my heart, but I don't want for that to be in my heart. Can you ever forgive me for that? I feel horrible about that. Most people, if you come to them humbly and explain, they'll say, sure, man, we're friends. I love you. I get it. It's a hard time. None of us have known what to do. If if you can get to that place, you know, taking the overflow of the heart, out from somebody and go, do they really believe that? They might, they might not, but if they double down, oh boy, then your temptation is to double down too, rather than go, Lord, help me. The deconstructionist question I, I want to circle back around to, if it's all right. Yeah. You'll edit it all back together. Yeah, yeah. So Chris, pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it. I, I think that it's a perilous thing to back away from the the church. I think that that's perilous. And I think that this is the best that we have. This is the best thing that we have, and it's the continuing body of Christ. So you're doing so at your peril. But if your faith is important enough for you to withdraw and you're sincere about it, I think you'll come back. Mm -hmm. I think you'll come back, and I think the church will be better off when you do. I would like for everybody to consider everything that they believe, question it, and wonder why, and seek out the answers biblically. I'm not afraid of deconstruction. There are barnacles on this big boat of Christianity, and I need to scrape those barnacles clean. I'm all for that. That's how we get the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. That's how we right the ship, you know? And so I, I'm not afraid of it at all. I, I think that um, to earnestly seek out the questions, uh, the answers to the questions in the Bible is the best way you can go. If you deconstruct it and the Bible falls aside, you're, you're on your own, sincerely. I mean, this is God's word. It's going to endure forever. 
if you lose that, you've lost it. Uh, you've got to have something that moors you to the faith, not just your faith, the faith. This is where it's contained. Um, the Bible is where it's contained. The church is where it's given a chance to practice. So. I think that's that's a real big reason why I want people to continue to go to actual churches or belong to actual churches, even if you're doing it online. Uh, because we we do need to bump up against each other because it's practice. Yeah. And if you're not bumping up against each other, you're more likely to get into an echo chamber yep. that just continues to agree with you yep. and reinforce things that are negative. Yep. And I don't think that's good and for anybody. People, a long time ago, Dale Carnegie and all these other things from way back when said that people are nine times as likely to say something bad as something good. And if you're in an echo chamber where people are nine times as likely to say something bad as something good, is the bad thing going to be about themselves or someone else? Mm -hmm. It's going to be about the other. And so we're going to be more and more and more and more and more divided and polarized. So bumping up against one another is very important. Um, I think that meditating on and thinking about scripture and processing through it and coming to a place where you talk to someone else about it. It's really important. We can be too dogmatic. We can be too touchy feely, you know, feeling based and we can be too supernaturalistic and we can be too naturalistic. Um, it's possible to go wrong in a lot of different ways, but Jesus hits the center of the mark every time. So if we turn our eyes on him, like Carl said, um, the pioneer, the author, the perfecter of our faith, we're much more likely to succeed in Christianity if we follow Christ. And as, as much as I love having listeners to the show, <laughs> my concern is that I, I don't want to become their church. Yeah. Um, and I don't want some radio pastor to become their church. Um, so for the listeners, I'd rather you stop listening than give up your church. So don't stop listening, but you can if you have to. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, a little closing verse here. Yeah. From Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 21. And the church is his body, and it's made full and complete by Christ. <laughs> Not our opinions. By Jesus, who fills all things, including us, everywhere with himself. Amen. That was a lot to take in. If I could give you one thing to walk away with, it would be this. The church is a we. It's an us. And we need you. No local church is perfect because it's filled with sinners. While my little church is experiencing a time of tension and divide over politics and public health, I need those people. All of those different denominational backgrounds, all of those opinions, all those different personalities sharpen us. They convict us. They challenge us. We need each other. And we need you in the Big C Church. Now, I'm not advocating for you to stay in an abusive church. Don't get me wrong. Aside from abuse, if our local congregation is filled with people who have gone to extremes, how will they know that there's another way if we walk out? Who will teach them to love if not us? Who will initiate the process of forgiveness if not us? Who will call a truce if not us? <laughs> <laughs>